Robinhood Radio and the Robinhood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Algorithm technology is now embedded in almost every major tech platform and every web-enabled device. It's a procedure for solving problems that can dictate what to buy, what to read, how we consume our news, where to go on vacation, where to look for a job, and even whom we should date. Whether we like it or not, algorithms have become a regular part of our everyday life. In his new book, A Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence, Karthik Hassanagar, a professor of technology and marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, examines the power of algorithms, their unpredictable behavior, and the risks that we're facing in this brave new world. It's published by Viking and brings Professor Hassanagar to our show now. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Len. You've done research on the, quote, personalized recommendations that media and retail websites make and how they affect consumer choices. How do they work? Well, these algorithms are embedded in most technology platforms we use, and they're making lots of decisions for us or about us. So most of our your listeners will be used to the algorithms on Amazon. People who bought this also bought this, or people who are viewing this also bought eventually bought these products. They drive over a third of the choices people make on the platform. And on Netflix, 80% of the media we consume is driven by the algorithms. And they're also influencing who we date and marry. Apps like Tinder, most of the matches are based on algorithmic technology. And, and, uh, and you say now it's, uh, it's uh, gotten into uh, criminal justice system, medicine, but, uh, get, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I want to get back to the, the Netflix, Amazon thing, because sometimes I wonder how they ever thought the thing that they're suggesting might appeal to me. Uh, that algorithm just misread me completely. But a, a friend of mine uh, told me that uh, some years back, uh, when she joined Netflix, she and her daughter decided to to see certain films, and so they chose um, uh, Persona and Jackass. And Netflix immediately started sending suggestions to somebody who might have liked both Persona and Jackass, not ever assuming that might be two different people in the same house were getting yeah. films. Yeah, this used to be a common early problem with recommendations, and I think most people would have experienced this where you and your partner are sharing the same Amazon account and you know, you're know you buying uh, from the same account and Amazon is confused about which one it is. And Netflix, again, the same thing used to happen. They have woken up to that fact. And so Netflix, for ex- example, today nicely supports multiple user profiles so that you can <laughs> indicate whether it's the dad or the mom or the ch- son or the daughter and whoever else who's using the account. So it's getting better. But yes, uh, growing pains for that technology. Uh, Amazon is all, Amazon Prime is also joined in. Uh, but I- is this really a bad thing? <laughs> After all, maybe I wouldn't have realized that there was this film or this book that I'd be interested in uh, without them suggesting it. Well, I think algorithms... I mean, it seems kind of innocuous <coughs> on some levels. Yeah, in, on many levels it is. But there are many levels where it is not as well. So first of all, I think algorithms are creating a lot of value. Imagine if we had to make these decisions without algorithms, without Google search, prioritizing our search results and saying, here's all the pages on this topic. Now you figure out which one you want. You know, the algorithm is super valuable. But we're also starting to see that the, these algorithms have the potential to mislead us or sometimes be biased and so on. And so that's where we need to worry about, where we become very passive and just do whatever the algorithm says. And when we do a, a Google search, for example, uh, there's a, there are a number of different pages. Uh, we assume that the first ones that we see are the most important ones. Sometimes you, if you really are interested in the topic, you have to go to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth page. So an algorithm has decided which 
which uh, item will go at the top and uh, the order of, of the various uh, things that they're offering? Yes. So when you do a search on Google, most of the times, you know, you and I are seeing less than 0.1% of the relevant web pages because mm -hmm. Google has figured out which of thousands or even millions of pages you should look at. And most people don't go beyond page one. I'm not suggesting that they should because, yes, you know, we value time and we need to make sure that we can go in and find the results we want. But there are times when these results, um, you know, sometimes can be biased. We've seen, uh, for example, with Google's autocomplete, there was, uh, you know, a news story about the autocomplete sometimes having a bias where if you type in women should, one of the autocomplete suggestions was women should stay at home mm -hmm. or women shouldn't and the autocomplete suggestion was women shouldn't vote. And then there were many uh, racially prejudiced suggestions as well. And of course, beyond Google, we've seen Facebook's uh, newsfeed algorithm. It couldn't recognize fake news stories. So we're seeing many examples of algorithms failing. If we wrote in the same request, would we get the same responses? Or do they already know who you are and who I am? Well, first of all, when we each type a search query on Google, we will get slightly different suggestions because those suggestions are based on our individual search histories as well. But at the same time, when we talk about some of these problematic uh, searches, when it surfaces and there's a lot of media coverage, Google, of course, immediately fixes it. But my whole point in my book, uh, Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence, is that we can't always react when things go wrong. We have to be proactive and prevent them as well. Isn't there something called incognito private searching? Does uh, that really make the search private? Well, yes, I think inc incognito is a mode wherein you know the search engine, or in fact, in general, any website, cannot keep track of you over the long run. So it is private in the sense. So privacy is one of several concerns. I've already touched upon bias. You know, bias is not going to be addressed with- uh, We're going to get to more to bias yes. in a little while because Absolutely. that's a major part of the story you Absolutely. tell. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, but incognito addresses some of the issues, but you know, again, the question is going to be, there's a tension here. Maybe you do want Google to know a little bit about you because there's value in personalization. We do want Netflix to know a little bit about us. The question is, are the companies respecting our expectations with regard to privacy? And if they aren't, sometimes then we have to walk away or do incognito. Can we conduct internet searches that aren't affected by algorithms anymore? Well, it's very hard to conduct an internet search today which isn't touched by algorithms because for most, almost any search term you, you pick, even the most esoteric ones, like you pick, let's say, vintage model toy trains, and I don't have my computer in front of me, but I'm going to bet for that search query again, there's hundreds of thousands of results. So to say that we're not going to have an algorithm curate those results and organize those results for us is a fool's errand because then you have these results organized randomly and then you have to go search through them it will take hours to do what takes us 10 seconds today. But isn't that the way life was conducted before algorithms came into the picture? Yes, but I think we, we did okay. We did okay, but we're trying to do wars. better. <laughs> exactly. We did okay. We're trying to do better. And I think the idea is let's not fight technology that has proved to be very productive for us. Let's figure out how to make it better. And it's like, you know, uh, you know early, I don't know, caveman or whoever came up with hmm. fire. You know, yes, fire was dangerous. That doesn't mean we walk away from it. We've got a lot of value from fire. But yeah, you use it carefully. So it's a matter of controlling the algorithms. You've also studied why people will trust algorithms in some environments, but not in others. Can you give me some examples? Yeah, I think algorithms, you know, there are some settings where, you know, let's say you're in an airplane and it's got a lot of automation and we know it's almost going in air quote uh, driverless mode and we're okay with that. But you uh, survey people about driverless cars, less so in some settings, some people are willing to trust an algorithm to invest their life savings. Some others are less reluctant. So sometimes we are willing to trust algorithms a lot and sometimes we aren't. And also it varies from one person to the other. So there's a lot of differences here. Well, you mentioned airplanes. Might the recent Boeing 737 MAX 8 crashes have been caused by algorithms? 
it's hard to say we'll find out soon but i can say the following which is that lots of studies show that people are willing to trust algorithms until they fail the moment you observe their first failure suddenly people are not as forgiving of algorithms even though they're forgiving of human failure much more than an algorithm failure mm -hmm. so it may be that the algorithm is performing better than the human but if we see it fail then they back off and that has implications for driverless cars you know when you hear about accidents you know we can't release them too soon if you want public to trust them and driverless cars uh, are still a popular option for many people i know i would prefer a driverless car to me actually having to drive but uh what kinds of mistakes have the algorithms been making I mean, why have we had fatal crashes since all the safeguards, at least in theory, have been put in place? Well, there's many kinds of algorithm failures. I think with uh, driverless cars, we've had a few crashes. It seems like in a couple of those instances, it was that the image recognition algorithms that are trying to figure out what's in front of you weren't perfect. And in one instance, this was the Tesla crash. The image recognition algorithm couldn't recognize a trailer truck which was turning and, and mistook it for the horizon because it was that white mm. color horizontally across the entire image and so it mistook it for the horizon. There was a separate uh, crash involving Uber and then it could not recognize pedestrian pedestrians because uh, in that instance um, it failed that way. Last week there was a story that a lot of these driverless car algorithms cannot recognize dark-skinned pedestrians as well as uh, uh, it can recognize light-skinned pedestrians. So again, there are implications, you know, if you're darker skinned, you need to worry a little more uh, when there's a driverless car around you. So I think there's many potential reasons. We've only talked about driverless cars. There are other settings where algorithms fail for slightly different reasons. Uh, but it's some of the same kinds of biases and limitations we humans have. Algorithms also sometimes have that. Well, that's to some degree because algorithms are really uh, put into the, the system by humans. So uh, do their biases, uh, are they reflected in how the algorithms work? Certainly, I think the origins of algorithms limitations have to do with uh, human limitations as well. But, you know, when we talk about biases, it's not always that these biases are coded in by an engineer, you know, the human who's coding it. Um, as an example, late last year, there was a story of Amazon trying to use algorithms to screen job applications. You know, Amazon hired uh, over 100,000 people the last couple of years, get millions of job applications. Humans cannot sift through that many resumes. So they thought they'll use algorithms. Not in the, Queens, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a long story, perhaps for another show of yours. It's an interesting topic to uh, discuss as well. But in, in that instance, it turns out that Amazon worked on it for two years and Reuters re reported that at the end of you know, two years, they couldn't get rid of a gender bias in the algorithm. Mm. And they eventually decided not to roll this out. And of course, you have algorithms being used in uh, now the how judicial would that, system. If, how would that gender bias have worked? Yeah, how did it come in? Is that what uh, you're yeah, asking? In other words, uh, in the end, uh, I would have thought the algorithm would be looking at work history, education, all sorts of other things. W would it really even matter whether the applicant was a male or a female? That's the interesting part. So certainly no programmer coded in if, if gender is female, then uh, you know reject. And furthermore, it's highly likely the gender was even hidden mm -hmm. from the algorithm. But what happens, and this is where, you know, we need to go back to what's driving algorithm behavior. And one of the novel or interesting, at least interesting to me, insights I had when I was writing this book is I was trying to figure out how do you explain these weird algorithmic behaviors. And I realized the insight actually comes from human behavior. So in psychology, uh, you attribute human behavior to nature and nurture. And nature is the genes we inherit from our parents and nurture is our environment. And algorithms are similar. Their nature or their, the equivalent of their genetic code is the code given by the programmer and their nurture is the data from which they learn. And it's not so much that the programmer is coding in this bias, mm -hmm. so it's not their nature, it's their nurture because they're learning how to screen resumes by looking at past data on who applied, who got the job, who got promoted. And it's trying to replicate that behavior. 
and now it starts to notice women aren't getting the job or not getting promoted and it learns to almost imitate that um and even if uh, the gender of the person is hidden it finds other things like the name of the person that is uh, a way to figure out the gender anyway unless the name is leslie or something like that well there are a few people who can get away with uh, you know, know gender whether, neutral name do people know whether karthik is uh, a male or female name uh, outside of india well probably not outside of india but there are enough indians around the world who have applied for a job at uh, amazon and i'm sure they have seen enough karthiks as well so they'll probably the algorithm will figure out i'm male my guest is karthik hasanagar whose uh, book a human's guide to machine intelligence is published by viking uh, an imprint of penguin random house uh, and this is Leonard Lopate at large on WBAI in New York, 99.5 FM. How has the development of artificial intelligence changed the way that algorithms work? Yeah, artificial intelligence is a field that's about 60, 70 years old. Uh, it's not obviously, you know, a very old discipline. So we are still in some ways in an early phase of trying to create intelligence in software. And there are many ways in uh, many ways in which to do so. But can we, be, by using artificial intelligence, can we eliminate some of the biases we were just talking about? Well, let me begin by saying a lot of the biases that I've been talking about actually come in because of artificial intelligence. Yes, we can I eventually use. Yeah, yes, we can eventually use AI to get rid of them. But you know, first we need to recognize it's coming from there, because. You know, if you look at how these algorithms are created, and we're trying to create intelligent algorithms, it used to be the case that we would create intelligence by coding in sets of rules. So for example, you wanted to create an algorithm to screen resumes, we would go interview recruiters and we would ask them, what do you look for? Give me the rules to find a high quality candidate. And they would give you a set of rules and you code that in. It turns out those rules can do reasonably well, but it's not, able to replicate a human being. And similarly, uh, you know, if you look at another setting, drive a car, I'll ask you, Leonard, give me all the rules to drive a car. And I can spend hours with you and you can give me thousands of rules. And I code that into software. It might be able to drive for five minutes, but it will eventually hit an accident. And the reason is that we have a lot of tacit knowledge we cannot express. Mm -hmm. You know the rules to identify your mother's face in a, cr uh, in a crowd, but you cannot express those rules to me. And so artificial intelligence has now evolved to, you know, instead of asking people, what are the rules, let's look at data and let's learn from it. And that's the domain of machine learning and getting systems to learn on their own through data. So if we want to drive, we will take videos of people driving, thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of hours of videos of people driving and we'll give that to a system and say learn. And now it observes the pattern. When should I break? When should I turn left? And it learns from that. But that data is now going to influence its behavior. If the data is biased, its behavior is biased. So artificial intelligence will learn the steps of the algorithms and then take in additional data and, and generate more algorithms, uh, more complicated algorithms to help the computers make more complex decisions for humans? Yes, the algorithms will improve over time and they will become more and more sophisticated as they see new and more data. So you've taken the human element out of this process but by, uh, by bringing machine learning into it. The idea was that if you had a human being teach the machine everything, the human being, as we have found out, cannot teach the machine everything because there's a lot of knowledge we have we cannot express. So now we've gone to a point where t we're telling machines Here's all the data on observed behavior of humans. Now learn to behave like them. Here's how doctors have diagnosed diseases. Here's a data set with a million patients. These were their actual systems and this was the final diagnosis by the doctor. Now the machine analyzes the patterns and figures out, you know what, if the person has a fever five days later, then it's not a common cold. We need to look at other options. If the person has a fever 10 days later, it's probably not viral. I'm, not, I'm going to rule out influenza and think of pneumonia. So but didn't doctors this. already know that sort of thing? Well, I gave you dumb <laughs> rules, which, uh, you know, a, a, a person like me who's not a doctor, well, I'm technically a doctor, but not the kind of doctor who's useful to patients. Uh, but, uh, you know, 
these kinds of rules, what I just mentioned, a doctor can tell you. But there's a lot of other rules that a doctor has which they cannot express. It's tacit knowledge. They can figure out how to match a patient's symptoms to other things they've seen in the past. And that pattern matching is not based on applying rules. And now they're relying on algorithms to, to give them advice. Absolutely. And now we've reached a point where if there is enough data, the algorithms actually can do quite well in learning how doctors diagnose. Furthermore, they can even beat most doctors in many settings uh, given a lot of data, you know, the human has to analyze all that data and we have limitations in terms of our ability to process that much data, the algorithm can do that. And so it can do better in many instances. So it has an important role to play. We're talking about medicine right now in medicine as a decision support tool for doctors to help them figure out, you know, what's the diagnosis and more importantly in the future, what's the treatment? Because medicine is going in the direction of personalized medicine. So you and I can walk in with the same symptoms, Leonard, but in the future, the treatments might be very different because of differences in our DNA and uh, biome and so on. And that's a domain where algorithms are going to play an important role. But why do I think there may also be problems along the way? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I think, you know, there's a lot of potential here, clearly. We can mm -hmm. cure diseases, we can, you know, make better decisions um, and so on. But I think we will have growing pains along the way. And the growing pains are going to be that the algorithms are evaluated very narrowly today. So for example, I mentioned with a driverless car, a recent study showed that dark skin color, it has difficulty recognizing. If you give it a data set, that doesn't have enough people with dark skin, then it's not going to be able to recognize them. And that's a problem in the data set. If you ask uh, an algorithm to screen job applications, but you give it a data set where people have biases based on race, color, or whatever, then it's going to have issues with that. Or let's say with Facebook fake news issue, uh, you ask an algorithm to curate news stories and you explicitly test and ensure that this algorithm does not have a political bias. It doesn't lean left or right. It'll do that well, but you didn't explicitly test it if it can screen fake news and so it'll fail there. Well, my idea of what's fake news and the, and the uh, concept of it by some politicians are quite different. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think uh, we are in a world where uh, you know, what is true, what is fake has uh, become a fungible concept, but uh, I'm going to keep my academic hat on and say that it's a binary concept for me. You write about chatbots in this book. Chatbots like Siri and Alexa have become quite popular. Are they driven by algorithms? Absolutely. These algorithms that are driving Siri and Alexa have to do two things. First, they have to understand language. They have to understand what are we saying. And then they have to be able to respond to that. And they, in the future, will drive a lot of value because you know, voice interfaces will really simplify how we interact with machines, how we interact with computers, and will also create many new use cases where you're in the car and you can just talk and, and do lots of things, uh, control equipment in your house, talk to friends, and so on. But here again, there, there is a word of caution here. And the interesting thing, uh, anecdote uh, that I share in the book is that there have been instances where chatbots have turned racist mm. and sexist and fascist. Um, and one example I discuss is Microsoft Tay. In the well, book. well, let's go back before Microsoft Tay okay. to what inspired it. Uh, the, uh, the did Microsoft launch uh, uh, Xiao Ice in in China in twenty fourteen? Yes, so it was a very interesting exercise where Microsoft Research launched a chatbot in China called Xiaobing in China and known globally as Xiao Ice. And the purpose of this chatbot was to engage in fun, playful conversations with uh, teenagers and young adults. And it was in the persona of a teenage girl. That chatbot was so popular in China, it had about 40 million followers in China. And the statistic I read was close to a quarter of those followers have said, I love you to Xiao Ice at some point because they feel mm -hmm. such strong connection with it. Now, given the success of Xiao Ice, Microsoft figured, why not try this elsewhere? But how does it work? 
How okay, does, so, yeah. so there's this teenager who's, uh, I, I get onto to Shawais, and the teenager says hello to me, and then uh, what happens? Well, you're chatting mm. with the teenager just like you, or with this chat board, just, might, just like you might be chatting with a friend or with another teenager and you know well. I would and ask so, her, what's wrong with algorithms? And what would she say? <laughs> well, I'm sure that's an interesting question to try. And my guess <laughs> is she might either say, oh, algorithms are nice. You know, then an algorithm is running me as well. And don't you enjoy talking to me? And she's kind of a very cutesy persona who's going to chat with you and and then ask you nice questions and fun questions about what music you like, what movies you like. And of course, if you're a teenager, she's going to ask you, who do you have a crush on? Why do you have a crush on them? And all those. And then suddenly people are like, wow, I love chatting with Shawais. It doesn't appeal to me, obviously. Uh, the idea of a, a teenager asking me personal questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, to what end? Well, this sounds like a time killer. I'm going to say here, Leonard, that the typical follower of Shawais wasn't like Leonard, right? Mm-hmm. So the typical follower of Shawais is probably a teenager who, you know, wants to discuss their personal insecurities and their interests and crushes and so on with somebody and they find a comfortable environment where somebody is chatting with you just like a human being but is not judging you is not uh you know again you're not under pressure to impress or, or you know all of those challenges with human interaction and so you get that and so these guys uh, or girls engage with this chatbot in very fun and interesting ways um, and it's taken off in China, and and it's not alone, right? A lot of people. I mean, there's many examples on YouTube where pe- people will be, uh, you know, kids will be chatting with Siri or Alexa, mm. uh, even here. So it's not even a cultural thing. Although with Siri and Alexa, you're just as likely to ask, um, "How do I get to such and such a place?" Uh, would you do that with Shawice as well? Well, I'm sure we're getting there. Eventually, as these systems get better and better, we'll get to a point where we're going to be having casual conversations with them. I mean, it's the domain of science fiction. We have movies like uh, Her and so on that have come out that uh, talk about relationships with chatbots. Uh, so we they function there like yet. therapists? They would function as therapists? There is, in fact, a chatbot called Wobot, which is a chatbot therapist. So you can actually discuss your problems with this therapist, and it walks you through your problems and situations and guides you through that. So we are, we are very much there today. So it's collecting information on us, Siri and Alexa. Is the information that Apple and Amazon are gathering on us linked to other accounts? Well, it's hard to say because they don't reveal where they use this, but it's reasonable to assume that they could potentially use this data elsewhere. Do you have Siri or Alexa in your home? Yes, I do have Alexa at home. And do you take any steps to protect your personal information? Great question. I take some steps, but honestly, it's minimal, like most people. Um, You know, we rarely unplug Mm -hmm. Alexa, because if you wanted to be 100% sure that it's not listening, then I I have to unplug it. So I've rarely had to unplug it, and I've rarely done it. But, um, you know, there are some basic steps I take. So, for example, when my kids are watching videos on my uh, computer, say on YouTube, I will try and log out of my account and go into child mode so that, you know, it it knows that this is a child watching and that you've got to curate the videos a little bit. Although I've had startling experiences sometimes. I'll be, my phone will be sitting in front of me and I will be having a conversation with somebody and I'll say, well, where can I find such and such? And suddenly Siri no, I have not asked Siri anything, and I don't use Siri. Siri will say, how can I help you find that? And I'm startled. Well, you They're should listening be. into my conversation. It's interesting. Well, first of all, be happy there is no one in your house whose name is Alexa. <laughs> I can't imagine what that household would be like, right? Uh, but, you know, I think for most of us, you know, we worry is are these systems listening even when they're not being prompted, you know, even when we've not said Alexa. There have been some claims, including by engineers and technical people who have provided some evidence that they might be listening even when they're not prodded. The tech companies are very clear in saying that, you know, unless you call out and say Alexa or Siri, they don't listen. 
who knows it's hard to say we're in a world where we don't have that kind of transparency on what exactly is going on behind the scenes i want to ask you about what happened when tay was introduced into the united states but we're going to take a, a brief break here on Leonard Lopez at large. We're back with Karthik Hosanagar, professor uh, of technology and marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he has written a book called A Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence. And uh, before we took that little break, we uh, were talking about what happened when Xiao Ice was launched in the United States as Tay. It was launched on Twitter? Yeah, driven by the success that Xiaowai has had in China, Microsoft figured they could launch something similar on Twitter. It was called Tay, and it was again targeted. T-A-Y. T-A-Y. And it was again, uh, you know, created in the persona of, a, you know, young adult and targeted at young adults. And they launched it. And within 24 hours, they had to shut it down because... The chatbot, which started off with friendly, polite tweets, within an hour or two was racist, sexist, you know, fascist, you name People the history. People were saying, it was done. It, she was saying Hitler was right. Yes, Hitler was right, and many, many more things. You know, some of these uh, tweets that it shared, it's just uh, offensive, ranging from, you know, Hitler was right um, to uh, tweets about, you know, again, gender, uh, tweets about race and so on, highly offensive tweets. Well, how did and that happen? Well, how can it suddenly go rogue? Uh, it didn't go rogue in China. It didn't go rogue in China, and it went rogue here. And it kind of begs this question, how could a similar chatbot deployed by the exact same company have such different outcomes? And I think there are two factors here. The first is Tay was trained to replicate the communication style of people tweeting to it. And so in China, there wasn't this explicit attempt by many people to try and trip mm -hmm. Shawais. I don't know why that is, are there cultural differences, or is it Big Brother is watching you that makes people behave better there? Who knows? But bottom line, Twitter is not where you learn how to converse with people. And Tay was trained to actually converse with people the way they were tweeting at it. So people would tweet offensive things to Tay, and it picked that up and it would respond offensively as well. And of course, there was also the, you know, you ask it an offensive question, it responds to that. And so, you know, it got tripped very easily. Could the character have been reformed or been used to further the dialogue on race and gender? The character could certainly have been reformed and certainly there could have been a dialogue on it. It was too much of a PR nightmare for mm -hmm. Microsoft. So they chose to shut it down immediately and then not to discuss it too much. Later that year, MIT's technology review ranked Twitter as one, I'm sorry, uh, Tay, as the worst tech <laughs> of the year. And that was how much news it made and that's why Microsoft had to shut it down. But since then, I think many companies are experimenting with chatbots and everyone who's designing chatbots now knows the Tay story and that's making them a little more gun-shy in terms of rolling out a chatbot too soon. And perhaps putting in safeguards to avoid the Tay debacle. Exactly. So now, you know, and I'm not saying everyone's doing this, but I think the companies that are more careful about this, they might add certain guidelines over here. In fact, right here in your studio, Leonard, I see a board here that says seven words you must not use because there are FCC violations. I won't, of course, repeat those words. It was words. actually a, a Supreme Court case. I think it was the FCC versus Pacifica, hmm. and uh, we lost. Interesting. So Be tell me more what happened. There. Well, what happened was uh, somebody uh, played George Carlin's comedy routine, okay. The Seven Things You Can't Say on the Air, and... Uh, and, and a listener complained, and the case went into the courts, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's why those seven words specifically are banned, because those were the seven words in the George Carlin comedy routine. Mm -hmm. If he had used other words, different words would have been banned. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so there's an unusual, interesting path. I was wondering why these seven, because I could come up with another. <laughs> yes, we all uh, could. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, a couple of them are rather uh, rather benign, but they were laugh words. Mm. 
I'm, I can't say them, unfortunately. Yes, yes. I, I'm sure your listeners <laughs> must be really curious. I and I'm tempted know. to re- say those words, but even I can't. <laughs> um, but coming back to today, you could have similar checks on those system where you could say these words are banned, this kind of conversation is banned, don't go into this area, and so on. And so, indeed, people designing chatbots will now have many of these kinds of safeguards. Uh, I want to get back to the whole idea of how algorithms see us and what assumptions they make about us. Um, You've been hinting at this. Uh, Do algorithms uh, often think a lot like their creators? Algorithms think a lot like either their creators or the data from which they're trained. And anyway, the data comes from human action. So if it's not the engineer who created it, it's the people uh, you know, around who well, you've, created you've it. mentioned race a few times. How does race affect algorithm and, uh, algorithmic decision making? Well, in settings where there is known race bias, algorithms have the potential to pick up those that race bias that exists in humans. So criminal justice is one area where there's been a lot of interest in race bias in general, independent of algorithms. And you write about a case in Florida where the courts used an algorithm to predict uh, how to sentence uh, uh, or, or deal with parole uh, and what the risk of that uh, person might be to commit another crime. Uh, what happened to that program? Well, so this was uh, a study or research done by ProPublica, and what they did was they evaluated an algorithm that was used in courtrooms in Florida to predict risk scores for defendants, risk scores such as the likelihood that they will reoffend. And that was used to guide sentencing decision by judges, parole decisions by parole officers, and bail decisions, and so on. <coughs> and what they found was that the algorithm had a clear race bias, that it was twice as likely to falsely predict criminality in a black defendant than a white defendant. And it was twice as likely to mislabel a white defendant as being low risk relative to a black defendant. And so that resulted in, for example, the case you mentioned, there was a situation where an 18-year-old girl whose previous uh, crimes were juvenile misdemeanors getting a risk score of eight, whereas there was a 41-year-old white male who had several armed robberies in the past and had actually spent time in prison get a risk score of three. And so this was one example of an evidence of race bias. The Paul Manafort decision must be driving the algorithms crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. And, And what's interesting about that setting is that these race biases that existed in the algorithms were despite the algorithm being denied information about the race of the person. So it does not have access to race. But what it's been what has happened, it's being trained on past data Mm -hmm. and it's been told here's how sentencing has been done in the past. Try and mimic that. And if if you deny it race, it finds other things like maybe your zip code or your name Mm -hmm. that is correlated with race and uses that to make recommendations. Data scientist and activist Kathy O'Neill has called algorithms weapons of math destruction. And she says that algorithms can reinforce discrimination. So um, how does industry respond to that? First of all, I'm going to say that I personally feel there is cause for concern, but you know I don't subscribe to the weapons of math destruction mm-hmm. uh, you phrase. You think that's going too far? I think that's going too far, and I fear that if we get overly skeptical about these technologies, we will miss out on a lot of value from these systems. Because, by the way, research shows that algorithms are on average less biased than human beings. Furthermore, while there's no evidence for it, I'm going to contend that algorithm bias and algorithm fairness and these kinds of issues are easier to fix than human biases. The problem with algorithm bias is that algorithms Algorithm decisions scale in a way human decisions don't, meaning that a biased judge can affect the lives of 500 people, but a biased algorithm can affect the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And so I think that's why we need to worry. Coming back to your point about, you know, how are, uh, or your question about how are companies reacting to this, I think for the most part, companies haven't fully woken up to this reality, up to this 
risk mm. that the algorithms that they're deploying poses to society. And there's not enough being done by companies and they need to uh, act on it. You've developed your own algorithms for business ventures. Uh, what have you learned from those experiences and how have you gotten around some of the problems? Yes, I've worked with many companies. I've founded a few com companies myself where my primary contribution has been designing the algorithms to automate decisions or improve decisions uh, that humans may be making. And for example, one of those settings was bidding in ad auctions that Google runs. So I would design the algorithms that would help advertisers figure out, you know, which search terms should I as an advertiser be bidding on? How much should I bid on it? Should I bid a lot so, I'd, so I'm ranked at the top or should I bid a little bit low? And so we created these algorithms, we tested their performance, it seemed to work really well. We deployed them and then a few weeks later I noticed a problem where the algorithm was actually hurting advertiser performance. And what I came to realize after I looked into it was that I was evaluating the algorithm very narrowly in one curated setting within my uh, you know, computer. And then when I deployed in the real world, I, am sim I was simultaneously bidding for multiple advertisers and asking them to bid for the same keywords and have them aggressively compete on the keywords, making it very expensive for them. And I realized that I hadn't understood the complexity of the system. Similarly, I've designed algorithms for recommending products to people and media to people. And one of the challenges with very popular, commonly used designs, such as people who bought this also bought this, is that they tend to rely on what others are consuming to recommend products and media to you. And the challenge in that setting was that if you really wanted to surface, you know, let's say indie bands for music lovers, or these very niche kind of books for people or movies for people, you're not going to discover them if you're only relying on what others are consuming. And so you need to modify these algorithms. And overall, my learnings through all of these has been that engineers tend to evaluate algorithms very narrowly, you know, one metric. Whereas in the real world, you know, algorithms have impacts on multiple aspects of decision making and of life in general. And so we need a more holistic way to evaluate algorithms. You co-hosted a show on Sirius XM called The Digital Hour. What were some of the hot topics that you discussed and uh, what did listeners call in about? Well, we discussed many topics, obviously. We could have taken to calls today too, but there's so much to talk about <laughs> that Indeed. I really, I, I didn't want to uh, take the time out. Maybe some other time we can have you back and talk, find out what the listeners are, are interested in as far as this is concerned. But go ahead. Yes, no, I would love that, but I'm very much enjoying this, uh, this great interaction and, and your questions. But yes, on the show we had, we discussed many topics. We talked a lot about artificial intelligence and the opportunities. We talked about what does artificial intelligence do to jobs and job creation in the future. We talked about virtual reality, but the one show where we got the most number of calls was actually shortly after the 2016 presidential elections, where I specifically discussed the role of algorithms in creating an echo chamber in society. Mm -hmm. whether we are getting our news and our content from algorithms on YouTube and on Facebook that is exposing us to more and more of what we already believe in and know and making us sort of live in this sort of echo chamber. And that got a lot of calls from people. Confirming our biases. Indeed, mostly confirming our biases. And in fact, one of the things I did after that show is I changed my news consumption habits. And you changed uh, your own. Yeah, I changed did, my own. Did writing this book also affect the way <laughs> you've conducted your life? Absolutely. As, as, as an exercise, in, as I was writing this book, I experimented with music algorithms, a number of different music algorithms to see what can help uh, diversify my music consumption, ex expose me to new kinds of music, because I'm guilty of being stuck in the 90s as far as music is concerned. And I feel the best music came from there, and that's all I listened to. Mm -hmm. And I explicitly try to break out of that trap by because I understand how these algorithms work, nudging the algorithms in different directions and seeing how they help me discover new music. I changed my news consumption patterns. I started going to one left-leaning, one right-leaning outlet, one moderate outlet. I actually, on YouTube, intentionally went to a few videos so that it would start showing me other stuff. 
And I'm sure I confused these algorithms. So YouTube must have been wondering, is this guy left-leaning, right-leaning, is he moderate? Because I was consuming a lot of different kinds of content. On the other hand, if you are watching something that takes a position that you don't agree with, you're watching it almost as a matter of research. Whereas if you're watching something that you do agree with, uh, then you're nodding your head and saying, yes, uh, that uh, whether it's Fox or MSNBC, uh, that host is correct. That panel is is telling the truth. I so, think- so in the end, we still bring ourselves to these things. I'm not exactly sure how algorithms might suddenly change my political views. Well, I'm going to say two years later, because I started this mm-hmm. in late 2018. Two years later, I'm my personal experience with this exercise is that I am more likely to see two sides of an issue than I did three years back. And that's mostly because I've persisted with this. I've gone every single day to New York Times and Fox News and Reuters. Every time I go to YouTube periodically, I will say, okay, I'm watching the same kind of five, six videos on the same topic. I'm not gonna switch to the exact opposing view. And I can say that I'm now willing to see more viewpoints. We all have a confirmation bias. There's no doubt about that. Mostly I'm looking for confirmation on my views. Mm -hmm. But when I see the opposing view a hundred times over two years, then I start to see, okay, there is that viewpoint as well. And we do see that when we go to YouTube. Suddenly the the things that pop up are the things that we, uh, that obviously reflect our political views uh, if we're looking for let's say, talk shows, things of that sort, uh, or our musical tastes. So they they know a lot about us. Yeah, absolutely. Or the algorithms do anyway. Exactly. Should I feel better that it's an algorithm and not a human, or is there some kind of a human factor in the, the way the algorithms are determining these things? I'm not sure it makes a distinction. I mm-hmm. think I would certainly worry if there's an individual human being who has my data then I would worried, be worried about what they're going to do with it. Uh, it's, but it's only one person I need to worry about. You know, in, this, in the case of algorithms, I think we all have this false sense of security because there's no face to this. And that's why I think sometimes we kind of, you know, if, it's a, if there's one person, I know this person I'm really worried about, there's a face to my, the menace I'm facing. Mm-hmm. But then with algorithms, there's no face to this menace. And I think lately, maybe the last few months, we've, Uh, done what I worry about as well, which is we've made the companies, the tech companies, the evil villains and kind of made them the face of this. And I think in in fact, what we have to do is the companies, the users and regulators need to work together on this. Haven't you also uh, produced five short films? (laughs) No. <laughs> yes. Do you do you dep- depend on algorithms to find out who actually wants to show a short film these days? Well, fortunately, my interest in making short films is a hobby with zero commercial interests. And so mostly I've made what I've wanted to make and um, shot it with some friends, put it up on YouTube. It doesn't get a whole lot of views. Maybe if I try and, uh, you know, keep account or keep in track how YouTube's algorithms work, I could try and make sure my algorithms surface a bit. But having said that, it is indeed true that many companies are analyzing data and using algorithms to figure out what kind of content will succeed. And a lot of content making and content production, which used to be purely artistic, is shifting to being more quant-driven or math-driven. Beyond algorithms, can I pick your brain a bit about uh, your brain as a professor of technology and marketing at the Wharton School. Uh, An article in the New York Times reported that according to federal government data, in 1960, 27% of women reported working in computer and mathematical professions. In 1990, that number had jumped to 35%. But after that, the numbers have continued to fall. And in 2013, it was down to 26%, below 1960. Do you have any Hmm. idea what's happening there? Well, I can certainly say that in our engineering schools, enrollments and application of uh, women candidates has gone down a lot. So we just, it's very rare in engineering schools to get applications from women. And I think we see this a lot. There's certainly been a big cultural shift in terms of women, in terms of us associating technology and computers 
with being a male profession. I think that's certainly a very valid observation. Although this has been discussed a lot, and you would yes. think that it would have affected young women who are attracted to computers. But early research on the topic found that boys were more exposed to computers in their homes, and fathers were more likely to spend time with boys on computers. Boys were more likely to get the family computer placed in their room than uh, the, the girls are. Uh, so, uh, and, and experts say that girls lose interest in math and computer science in, in middle school that early. It's interesting, and I'm going to say there's perhaps a cultural aspect to this. When I was growing up in India, and I was in an engineering school, well, there was indeed, you know, not a 50-50 kind of split. There were more men than women in our engineering colleges. It wasn't as extreme as what I see in the U.S. And there were a lot more women in our engineering schools. Um, and I don't think it was typecast as a profession for men. I don't think there was this notion. In fact, in some ways, there was a uh, almost a gender generalization the other way where women were told, hey, if you do mechanical engineering in a factory floor, it's tough, you know, computer science might be easier for you. So there was gender generalization for sure, but certainly in terms of enrollment, it wasn't as biased. Here, you know, again, as you say, you know, what's going on in the household matters, what's going on in the school matters, the actual way in which people discuss this matters. One example I'll give you is you know, there's chess, you know, I, I, I play a little bit of chess. Uh, I go to chess tournaments dominated by men. You know, I'm trying to get my daughter to play some chess. And one of the highly recommended books for chess is how to beat your dad at chess. Mm -hmm. It's not how to beat your mom at chess, it's how to beat your dad at chess. So it's also telling my daughter that, you know, the dad is the one who plays chess. We only have a few minutes left, but um, can we have a little summation on algorithms? In the end, uh, we've talked about how posi the positives and the negatives, but in the end, the negatives can be rather scary. The negatives can be scary, and one of the things that's going on is that there is a lot of fear-mongering because we hear about these instances, and one of the things I wanted to do with my book, A Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence, is to balance that conversation and shift it towards solutions. I don't think we should feel as helpless as many people feel. I think as individual consumers, we have a lot of power, and our po power is our knowledge, our votes, and our dollars. And by knowledge, I just mean that we shouldn't be passive users of technology. We should be deliberate about it. We should understand what we're doing, what technologies are we using, how is it changing the kinds of decisions we make. And it might sound like it can't affect things much, but look at how Facebook is redesigning their product today because of user pushback, because users got informed and they pushed back. Votes is about uh, you know, choosing elected represent, uh, representatives who actually are savvy about these issues and are, understand the nuances and will provide consumer protection. So I think that we have these kinds of powers. And then uh, the other thing that I feel is that our regulators can play an important role. So one of the things I've proposed in the book is a Bill of Rights. Just like you know, a Bill of Rights is a basic set of fundamental rights the US Constitution gives citizens to protect these citizens from a potentially powerful government, in, in very similar ways I propose an algorithmic Bill of Rights to protect users from very powerful algorithms and technology companies. And so this Bill of Rights, I talk about things like you know, right to transparency, about the data being used to make decisions about you. You know, when I applied for a job, did the company use other data like my social media posts in order to make that decision? Transparency about what data was used, explanations regarding what drove the decisions. A little bit of control to the users, like being able to say, Alexa, I'm asking you to turn off until I turn you on through this other way. You're not listening to anything. Can't do that now? Well, there's no formal way unless you unplug Alexa, right? I mean, it would be nice to actually give an explicit instruction. Again, we're told it won't be listening unless we actually say Le Alexa, but we don't know. But having some control is useful. And the last thing I propose is audits. Companies should get into this process of auditing algorithms before deploying them in socially consequential settings. So that would mean having people other than those who develop the algorithms actually validate the algorithms before they're deployed. But no matter what, algorithms are here to stay. Algorithms are here you to stay. Do you see anything else on the horizon, or are they the ultimate? 
they are the ultimate they are here to stay i think we can't wish them away and honestly my message is we shouldn't wish them away let's learn how to make them work for us that's the main uh, story in my book or message of my book karthik hosanagar k a r t i k h o s a n a uh, G A R. His book, A Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence: How Algorithms Are Shaping Our Lives and How We Can Stay in Control. He is the John C. Howard Professor of Technology and Digital Business and a Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks for having me, uh, Leonard. And today is a good day because it's the day the book is releasing. So I'm happy to have had this conversation here. And that brings us to the end of our show. My great thanks to Kate Guan, who produced it, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, to Reggie Johnson, who was at the audio controls, and to my executive producer, Jesse Lent. Modern Lopate and Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week.